I'm Allison Singer from the Autism Science Foundation, here today at the Yale Child Study Center in New Haven, Connecticut, with Dr. Rhea Paul. Dr. Paul is Professor and Director of the Communication Disorders Section at the Yale Child Study Center. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, Allison, and I want to express my appreciation to the Autism Science Foundation for your continued support of research in autism. Uh, you make a big difference in the work that we do here. Well, thank you. We appreciate that. Now, your work specifically focuses on the communications domain of autism spectrum disorder. Can you tell us a little bit about the work that you're currently doing with toddlers? Sure. Um, we're very interested in uh, understanding the communication of very young children with autism because, as you know, communication is one of the core symptoms of autism spectrum disorder. And in all children who have autism, communication is impaired, whether they're the highest functioning, most intelligent children or children with significant intellectual disabilities. So we like to learn how that communication unfolds and how it supports their uh, development in a variety of areas and the ways in which it impedes their development. So one of the things we've been studying over the past few years is the, um, the emergence of pre-language communication. What do kids do before they start talking? Because we do know that almost all toddlers with autism are delayed in their development of language. They tend to say their first words later, put words together later. Um, it just takes them longer to move into language. So we've been studying what happens before that language emerges. And one of the things that we've discovered is that children with autism make sounds, speech sounds, very similar to those that are made by typically developing children. They learn their speech sounds in the same order. They're not in a, in a jumbled order. Um, and generally, they use their speech sounds in babbling um, similarly to normally developing children, although not as often. So they produce less babbled speech, but the babbled speech that they produce is not very different. There are a couple of small areas where we see differences, um, and one is that they tend to combine sounds differently. For example, in English we can say B and L together in a word like blue, but we don't say B and P together in a word like B -p that's not a combination we can use in English. But uh, some toddlers with autism do use those unusual combinations that aren't being used by other speakers in their environment. So what we gather from that is that um, they're not listening as much. They're not tuning in as much to the kinds of speech sound combinations other people are using. And they're using a range of combinations that might be a available in other languages, but aren't available in the language that they're hearing spoken every day. So there seems to be less attunement to the speech in their environment. Um, then we've looked at how those early pre-speech utterances relate to later language development. Do they predict? So if you know how many sounds a child makes at two, can you say anything about how they'll be able to talk at three? And there we've made a, uh, I think, somewhat interesting discovery, which is that it's not the speech sounds that predict that outcome later on. It's the degree to which children with autism use unusual non-speech kinds of vocal productions, things like screams, cries, grunts, the things that other babies are starting to reduce in frequency towards the end of their first year of life, around their first birthday. But the children with autism who continue to use those non-speech kinds of vocalizations are the children that tend to have more delayed language as they go on into the preschool period. So what that makes us think is that one way we can help those children is to encourage parents to play with sounds as often as possible in their toddlers that are suspected of having autism. To, in a very playful, fun way, we don't want this to be work, um, to just babble with the baby whenever the child starts babbling for the parent to imitate the child and babble back. And in any way they can, encourage the child to make sounds that sound like speech. And we think that um, by increasing the frequency of those speech-like productions, we may be able to move the language along a little more quickly. So if a parent uh, finds that his or her child is producing these pre-linguistic sounds that are different from typical children or is not eliminating them in the way that typical children do, um, other than what you were saying before about uh, working with them. Is, is there anything they should do? Are, is this an early biomarker? Is this a new 
sign of autism that we should be aware of? What should parents make of this? Well, I don't want to jump too quickly to conclusions. We've done a couple of studies with a relatively small number of children, so I don't want to oversell this and make people overly worried. Um, but it does seem to be the case that children that are producing lots and lots of this non-speech after the age of 12 to 18 months may be children that are having more difficulty with um, moving away from baby talk and towards real language. I would say that if parents feel their children are using too many of these non-speech sounds between 12 and 18 months, the first thing they should do is have their child's hearing tested because there are other reasons why a child might not be moving towards speech. And hearing is certainly the first thing we'd want to investigate. If the child's hearing appears to be normal and the parents are still concerned, then they could certainly seek an evaluation. But um, there's really a, a lot more that goes into having autism than just the kinds of sounds you make. And we really can't, at this point, focus on just one symptom. Um, what we're trying to do is uh, look at the range of behaviors that children exhibit in this beginning of the first year of life when autistic symptoms tend to appear and try to identify which constellation of symptoms might be most indicative. So I'd, I'd not encourage people to focus in on just one symptom, but to try to see their child's development as a whole and to seek an evaluation for any child that they have concerns about and not to um, be overly anxious that one thing might mean a diagnosis. Do you see any differences in the pre-linguistic communications of children who struggle more uh, with autism, those who are more challenged, who we might call lower functioning, versus those who are higher functioning or later go on to be diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome? Yes, I, I think there are differences, but again, I'd have to say that this is not a uh, evidence-based uh, statement. It's really just a, an impression from having seen of a lot of toddlers that by, if by 18 months the child hasn't started to really sound more speech-like, the chances that they will have significantly delayed language are greater. But again, that's really just an anecdotal observation at this point. So what's next? What is the next phase of this research? What can we next expect from your lab here at Yale? Well, another area that we've been pursuing for some years and that I hope is going to come together with this line of research we've just been talking about is our work on auditory perception. That is, we play sounds for children and measure how long they spend listening to the sounds. And we take the length of time that they spend listening as an index of how much they like the sounds. So we speculate that they'll listen longer to things that they like. And we've already shown uh, that toddlers with autism don't like child-directed speech as much as other children do. So they like it, they like it better than non-speech, but they don't like it quite as much. And what that suggests is that maybe they spend less time listening to it, tuning into it, attending to it than other children do, and that too might uh, affect the rate of language acquisition that they're able to show. So um, we're continuing to work on that auditory preference side and uh, working Continue, continuing to work on the vocalization side and what we hope is for those two things to come together so that we could see whether children who have more atypical vocalizations also spend less time listening to um, mothers talking to them, uh, whether those two things together predict language outcomes more powerfully than either one individually. Uh, so that's the direction we're going. Um, but another direction that I think we'd like to pursue is finding ways to engage those very young children who, have, who seem to have autistic symptoms in being interested both in babbling with other people and in listening to other people. Because I think both those pieces, the auditory attention and the vocal production, contribute to the child's language development. And we'd, we'd like to figure out ways to make those social, verbal, vocal interactions more appealing to children with autism. They don't appeal to them as much as they do to typically developing children because that's part of the nature of the syndrome. So we need to figure out ways to make those things that are good for language development appealing to the child who's not naturally oriented toward them. So will the next step be to develop an intervention specifically that to target these areas of deficit? I don't know if it's the very next step, but it's certainly a place that I'd like to get to. There are a couple of ideas that have been thrown around, not 
really any empirically based evidence. But uh, for example, there's a, a researcher um, who has been looking with typically typically developing children uh, at whether you can reinforce children's babbling by providing them with uh, robotic toys that respond to vo vocalization. So they say something and the toy activates. And we think maybe that's something kids with autism might like and might encourage them to increase their vocalization frequency. Um, we're, we've thought about ways to engage listening skills by pairing speech with something else that the child really enjoys so that whenever the parent starts talking, for example, lights flash or a toy dances or something so that the child's attention is drawn. So what we think is that we need to help the child figure out what's relevant in the environment and how to interact with the environment by figuring out things that are reinforcing for them since the normal things aren't reinforcing for them. So that's kind of the direction we're going in, but I really want to emphasize that we are not there yet. <laughs> well, that that's fascinating, and we look forward to hearing more about all of these studies and the intervention that is a few years away, but hopefully on its way. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today, and um, again, we look forward to hearing more from your lab in the future. Thank you, and thank you again to the Autism Science Foundation.